So I'm working on a fairly large coffee table top. This is the top. I'm planing it down and um, I wanted to use this opportunity to make a completely separate video from this this project build in order to discuss breadboards. Um, I watch a lot of YouTube myself and one of the most poorly executed woodworking um, design elements I see is breadboards. And I think part of that reason is because most of the joinery used in breadboards is hidden from view. So if you're making something off of a picture, you don't realize that that breadboard um, is attached the way it's attached. And a lot of people end up gluing and screwing them to the ends of their boards, which eventually is most likely going to lead to failure of the top itself. So I kind of wanted to demystify breadboards, talk about their um, purpose, what they're used for, and it was going to end up being long enough that I made it into a separate video that I could reference instead of going through all of it every single time I make a breadboard. So the main reason I use breadboards and other people use breadboards is to keep that large flat panel from cupping over time. Now breadboards are not necessary. Um, High-end dining room tables usually do not have them. But in smaller shops like this where you do not have a plethora of a ton of machinery and for all DIYers, I just like to use them because first off, I like the way they look and it guarantees things I make will stay true over the lifetime of the piece. So in order to keep that top from cupping, you need almost essentially a rail at the end of your panel, but the rail cannot be permanently attached to the breadboard, which is where the mortise and tenons come into play. You don't have to worry about this panel expanding across the length, but you will have to worry about each one of these pieces of lumber, and there's five in this top, expanding across the width. So the breadboard will keep your top true, but also hiding that expansion. Frame and panel construction is also an example of, of uh, being able to hide that expansion contraction in woodworking, as well as board and batten. Um, applications especially on exterior pieces because the wood is going to move a lot more as well as tongue and groove flooring is another example of of a concealing that expansion and contraction so to start this process i glued up a panel that was larger than what i needed because i was going to be trimming it down now my breadboard is going to be five inches wide um, standard size is about three to four inches, but since this isn't a kitchen table and I didn't have to worry about people leaning on the edges of the breadboard, I went with a thicker board because I think it matched the table better. So my uh, breadboard is about five inches wide and I'm coming two thirds of the depth of it in for the mortise which means there's about two inches left on that edge. So I subtracted that four inches, two for each side, from my total width, which had to be 66 inches. So I cut this down to 62 inches. And I just rip the edges off with um, a skill saw. I get a real nice clean cut with these worm drive skill saws. Um, so that's how I decided to do it. Then I just measure, I have marks on my breadboards and marks on the table, and I measure to make sure I'm still going to be within that 66 inch top before I make my second cut. Once that looks all good, I make the second cut as well, and now I have um, that 62 inch top. So once that's done, I measure for how big my tenon's gonna be, which I said earlier is about three inches. So I mark three inches on either side of my table with a straight edge. I line everything up once again and measure double, triple check to make sure it's gonna be 66 inches. And with the marks on all my pieces, it's perfect. So I saw this tip on fine woodworking. You basically take a scrap cut off from your whatever top you're making so it's the same thickness as your top and then some scrap plywood some straight scrap plywood and you make this sandwich sort of jig so it fits on the edge of your table 
but it will give you two equal straight edges, one on the top and one on the bottom. So when you go to route out that tenon, it's the perfect distance setback on the top and the bottom. This jig allows you to do that, and it kind of avoids a lot of catastrophes. Um, if your tenons are different distances from the edge on top and bottom, your breadboard will have a gap on one of side or the other, and you'll have to fix it. So this is a really easy jig to make. Um, I just screwed together these pieces. I made mine nice and tight so it can't move around on me. And once I had that, I could figure out the, um, the thickness. So you're basically cutting your tabletop into thirds. This is about a seventh eighth inch top. So whenever I have um, incremental measurements, I sometimes will use metric because it's easier. So this was about 22 millimeters and I cut that down to 11 so that I could find my center and then marked a quarter of an inch because this is going to be about a quarter of an inch and then I could draw some straight lines. It just makes it easier than worrying about trying to cut fractions of an inch and half. And then this little mark I will use to set the depth of my router. You can see it's just about perfectly a quarter of an inch now. So I use that mark to set the depth of my router, and I don't show it in the video, but I will also use this mark as a test cut on the edge of the tenon to make sure I'm going the same distance from the top and the bottom. So once I had that done, I um, set up my router to find the offset from the center of the, the bit. Um, every router is going to be different. I think mine is a little over two inches. So I'm adding that distance to the top. I think it came to about five and a quarter. I'm coming off the edge and drawing another straight line. And then this straight line is going to be where you set up that jig. Now I'm using a down cut spiral bit for the edge because I don't want to have to worry about any tear out um, where that breadboard is going to meet the table because it's quite unsightly which means I ended up using two bits for this. If you have um, a variety of nicer bits, you can get away with just using one. So once I had that second line, like I said, this jig is a very tight fit, which I prefer over a loose fit. I spent some time lining it up. You can't see it, but the front edge of this jig is in line with the front edge of my line. And um, I tapped it into place, and then I just test al along the length of my, my piece to make sure that bit is hitting the line at the exact right part point. And I really didn't need these shims because it's a tight fit, but I, I threw some shims in there so it can't move around on me as I'm routing. And then I use that straight cut spiral bit. I do a test run just to make sure I'm, I'm hitting that original mark I made, that three inch mark properly. And then I kind of go through the front and the back. In the back, I make a rather large groove. It's going to be about an inch wide. And then I'm going to come back with a straight cut bit and remove the excess. The reason I'm making this groove so wide is so that straight cut bit can't go past the distance of my line since it's thicker than the quarter inch spiral bit I'm using. So I make that nice groove. I'm doing this incrementally because you're, you're removing a fair amount of material. So once I have that groove on both sides, you can see now I'm using the straight cut bit in the same manner to go through. It just removes that excess faster. So like I said, if you have um, some sharper bits, my bits are a little bit older, you could probably get away with using one at a time. And then I'm just going to go through and remove all that excess. Um, like all things in woodworking, there's other ways to do to cut these parts and pieces, but I utilize the materials that I had, and the router for me is the simplest way to do it. So it's it's just a, a process, and then you can see how this straight cut bit can't go past my mark, so I don't have to worry about marring up the edge of my table, and then I just remove the excess with, with a sh very sharp chisel, and then plane down that tenon. And then once I have this done on one side, I could I could flip this piece and that, that jig stays in place, which is, is so convenient. And I could do the exact same thing on the other side. So once that's done, my method for um, finishing this tenon is to turn it into a haunch tenon. So you do not want this entire piece to be connected as one long piece because that wood will act as one uniform piece. By splitting it up into smaller four inch sections is usually the recommendation for the, um, the width of a tenon. Um, after that you should be breaking it up 
they'll act, they, they won't be as subjected to changes in humidity. So I go through and mark and, and cut one inch off the edge so you won't see that in the breadboard. And then luckily for me, this panel tenon ended up being 36 inches wide so I could easily split it into segments of four. Then I'm adding the little haunts section in the front there with a three quarter inch piece of plywood I marked. So you'll have a long tenon running the entire piece which will help prevent twisting, but yet you'll have these, um, I ended up with five, five longer tenons that will go into your mortises. So this is basically the strongest way to do it with still keeping all of your pieces aligned and resisting twisting. So after I cut through my marks with the saw, I go through and just drill into all the corners so I have somewhere to put a saw. And I was able to twist my coping, coping saw into place and then cut out, out the pieces I needed to. Um, this was a pretty simple process with those drilled holes and going through with the coping saw. You could see then I'm left with those five longer tenons and then that one, um, one tenon the width of the whole piece towards towards the table. So then I could put the material I'm using for the breadboards underneath and I mark all of my pieces. I'm marking the ends of the table because I'm gonna, not going to want to cut past that otherwise you'll see it in the ends of your breadboard and then I could go through and just mark all those for where I'm going to drill those mortises onto onto my piece. I'm also going to transfer the depth of the top onto there because I'm going to be cutting out the, the beginning part of the mortise with my table saw and even though I have this pretty well aligned um, it might not be exactly in the center so it's just easier to transfer those depth marks onto your piece so that it will be flush with the tabletop. So to start this cut I'm using a quarter inch um, dado stack in there and I'm lowering it onto the blade because like I said I'm not going past the marks on my board for where the end of my table is otherwise you'll see it and then I'm just slowly cutting that tenon uh, that mortise based on on where I had the marks and it's the same on both pieces so I could do both of them and then I'm slowly raising up the height of that blade until I have that three quarter inch depth you could see I test it um, on the side there and I just creep up on it so then once I have that, because I'm using a circular blade, you're left with a little bit of a, a, a lip there that you have to chisel out. You can see my far, far mark on the edge is the mark I definitely do not want to go past. And I just use um, a set of chisels to, to remove that waste so that I have a nice square joint. Um, since this is cherry, it's pretty easy easy to work with, and this, this came out pretty quickly. I had to do it on on the two pieces. So once that was done, my method for finishing up these mortises is to use a drill press just because they're so deep. So if you go with a more standard size, like three or four inches, you could probably do this with a router, but um, I ended up using a drill press and I'm drilling a little bit wider than my marks because you want those tendons to be able to move inside those mortises. So I'm just going down the line and drilling those holes. You could see I'm left with a series of five holes and a little bit of, of material to remove in there. So the easiest way to take this out is once again with a chisel. Um, it's a very narrow deep groove so the hardest part of this honestly is just seeing, seeing into that recess to make sure you have everything removed. At the top I mainly use a chisel to get out a lot of the excess but once I get a little bit deeper you can see I'm using a drill to just kind of scrape across that mortise and you end up with a nice clean joint by doing it that way. This is a little bit of a process but it actually goes by pretty quickly and you could clean out those holes fairly quickly um, really dependent on how close you were able to get them drilled on the drill press. The, the, the less um, material left in the hole before you start this process the faster it goes but then you see you're left with a nice um, clean mortise. So then it comes time to dry fit and you could see on the, the two outer tenons on either side not the center one um, I put some wax on there just so that this slides on a little bit easy and this is the first test fit and it went on nice and smooth but there's a little bit of a gap between the breadboard and the end of the table so the way I, I try and rectify that is I go through and I check all of my depths um, and I found out towards the end of my piece the uh, part of the haunch tenon was a little too thick. 
I hadn't taken enough off at the coping saw, so I cut off just a little bit. It was like a sixteenth of an inch on that one haunch all the way at the end, and then um, I could dry fit this again. And the dry fit on the other one went pretty similarly, and that's just because you could see that if you had gaps in, in depth differences between your your upper and bottom tenon, um, this wouldn't sit flush. So I was really happy with the fit. Then um, I thought I had my camera on when I was drilling the holes for the breadboard and I didn't. So you could see kind of where I have my center X's where these holes went and these are three eighths inch holes and I just drilled them through on my drill press and then I'm marking centers with that same drill press and all of the holes. I mark centers because I'm going to draw board these dowels into into the holes so I'm marking about a sixteenth of an inch up of where that center is so I'm technically drilling this hole off center you can see my mark um, and I'm doing this freehand because I can't fit this table on my table saw and I have a stock block underneath of it to um, prevent tear out so I start these fairly slowly just to get them going and then you could see um, I go straight through and I have a nice tight hole, go through and do all 10 of those. And then once that breadboard's back in place, you can see how that hole's off center. So when you put that dowel in, it'll pull that breadboard into the table. So next and lastly, I can make my elongated holes. And this is where the magic is. This is which what will allow um, these pieces to move without being able to see all of the uh, mechanics behind it. So I'm elongating those holes and these are pretty long and that is because my shop doesn't have temperature control so the changes in humidity are sometimes drastic going to the customer's house. So I, made sh I make sure I, I put nice long holes in there and my tenons are nice and big so it won't affect the integrity of that. You just want to make sure not to be going um, vertically. You want to keep that 3 8 inch hole vertical spacing accurate so this can't move around on you. It's the width that you're expanding only. And I'm technically not going to be able to fully finish this video because I didn't have the dowels I needed um, in time to put this all together. But when it comes time to put it all together, you're only going to be putting glue on that center tenon. The rest of these you want to be able to move, which is why it's so important to get a nice tight fit because really the only thing that is holding this in place is going to be five dowels and a little bit of glue in the center. But I would put this on and then sink those five dowels into the holes and then this would be pulled together. And then you could see the first reason people don't make these is probably lack of knowledge, but the other reason is because it takes a, a, a decent amount of time. It's going to take much longer than just gluing, gluing or screwing something to the end of the table. 